Good morning and welcome to worship here virtually at uh, Montrose Zion United Methodist Church. My name is Jennifer Dyer. I'm the Director of Youth and Young Adults here at Montrose. I want to welcome you here and also um, let you know that this is Laity Sunday, so the service is going to look a little bit different, but we're so excited to share some of the um, thoughts and reflections that some of you have had on the Gospel of Mark. So let me open with a word of prayer. Lord, we come to you this day seeking your healing and restoring love. Give us courage to reach out to you in the good and easy times, as well as in the times of strain and stress. Open our hearts to receive your message of peace and hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Morning. Thanks for joining us. My name is Joe Lehman. I'm the worship director here at Mantra Zion United Methodist Church. We're going to start off by doing some singing. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you.
All right, kids, it's time for the children's message, and that means you can come a little closer to the screen, and we'll tell you our story. Well, hi, everyone. Me and Joe just love glow sticks. They glow and glow and glow. And I get it, sometimes in the light, it's hard to see, like right now, but it still works. This reminds me of a Bible verse I found in John. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Even though it seems dark outside, Jesus' light still glows. And maybe you're not able to see with your eyes, but Jesus' light always glows, even when we don't know it. Our Lord also told us that we, the believers of Jesus, also have this light. That means we are lights, and so are you. Let us show you something in the dark. Look! I'm glowing! You couldn't see this a few minutes ago, but now you can. And this cup of water is also glowing. I wonder what happens if you drink it. Now God's light is inside me! Just kidding. You don't have to drink God's light to have it inside you. Remember, Jesus promised that his followers would be lights too. Are you a light? When God looks at you, do you glow? Join me in prayer. Precious Lord, Creator God, we are reminded of your majesty when we see your creation. We thank you for the gift of sunny days, nourishing rain, and the liveliness of the nature that surrounds us. We as members of this church are sad to be away from one another, but on a laity Sunday, we are reminded that we do not just go to church or join the church, but we are the church. So we ask you to guide us as individuals and as a group, strengthen us for whatever work it is that you want us to do. We ask your blessings on all those that work for the betterment of this congregation, both clergy and laity. We ask your blessings on the very young and the very old, on the strong and on the weak. And we calm and quiet our minds and our souls so that we may dwell in peace with you forever. Amen. Good morning. Friends, today we're going to be celebrating Laity Sunday. Now the word laity is one of those church jargony kind of terms. It simply means all of the folks in the congregation. And so today I want to thank you all, all of our unpaid servants, for all of the great ministry you do and for creating a great community to worship within. 
Your ministry that you do is absolutely vital. But for today's morning's message, way back at the beginning of all of this mess of our, of our online worship of, of the coronavirus, Gary Pennington came up with a great idea um, of having our congregation read through a book of the Bible together um, while we were away from one another. Um, I ended up picking the book of Mark, thinking that with 16 chapters in the book of Mark that we should be through this mess in 16 weeks. Well, that was my hope back in March. And now just after myself having coronavirus and recovering, I'm aware that we still have quite a ways to go. But stay tuned because we also may be selecting an additional book to be reading through together as a congregation. But back in March, each week, one of the members of this congregation reflected a little bit on each of their assigned chapters. And this morning, Paul Levy, Sarah Port, and Jim McCarger are all willing to share their reflections for our message of hope and joy and salvation in Jesus Christ. And so thank you all again with the many ways that we're keeping our church together. You're doing so much to help us move forward in the name of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Thank you. This reading's from Mark chapter 5, verses 5 through 13. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him. And he shouted at the top of his voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he had said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. He begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there on the hillside a great herd of swine was feeding, and the unclean spirits begged him, Send us into the swine, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned in the lake. After reading Mark chapter 5, two words immediately came to mind, miracle and faith. As I further contemplated the three miracles performed in this chapter, I was struck by the supernatural feel. There is possession by demons. My name is Legion. A resurrection, a faith healing, all events that today seem so far outside what one might reasonably believe, especially in an age dominated by science and evidence. Ah, but faith isn't about evidence and faith and belief are not the realms of science beyond the belief in a rational universe. In Mark 5, we see examples of what I would call extreme faith. The chapter begins with a man with an impure spirit who emerges from the tombs. No chains could subdue him. He wandered the hillsides, crying out, cutting himself with stones. One can only imagine the suffering this man, and by extension, the fear among those with whom he came in contact. The interaction between this man and Christ is remarkable in so many ways. And what can only be described as miraculous, Jesus casts out the impure spirit, prompting the man to fall to his knees and exclaim, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. The remainder of the story is well known. The demons cast into the herd of swine, plunge headlong into a lake and are drowned. Despite the miracle witnessed by the swine herders and upon seeing the man cured of the impure spirit, the locals ask Jesus to leave the region. So rather than belief to choose faith, people instead reacted with fear and rejection. I wonder how we would respond today, faced with similar circumstance. There was someone from the encounter that believed, the man possessed by the impure spirit. Jesus commanded him to provide witness to the miracle. We learn that all who heard the story were amazed, but one can be amazed and not believe. The second miracle in Mark 5 was performed somewhat unknowingly on a woman suffering from 
bleeding for 12 years. The woman seeks out Jesus with a steadfast belief that by touching Jesus' clothing, doing so, she would be and is indeed healed. Jesus says to the woman, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. A particular note in this passage is that the woman is one among a large crowd of people surrounding Jesus. And yet Jesus is aware of her touch as he realized that the power had gone from him. The resurrection of the daughter, daughter of Jairus, the synagogue leader, is the final miracle described in Mark 5. All surrounding the parents believe the daughter to be dead. In fact, Jesus responds to those who believe her to be dead. Don't be afraid. Just believe. Even as Jesus later says to those of the synagogue leader's home that the girl is not dead, but asleep, they scoff and laugh at him. This miracle is witnessed by only the child's father and mother, as well as Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And oddly enough, Jesus gives strict orders not to let anyone know of this miracle. So what are we to gather from this chapter as it relates to faith and miracles? How does this chapter inform our faith? It seems that those moved to belief and faith are those most directly impacted. Witnessing a miracle should immediately lead to faith. Yet in these passages, we see the masses are not moved to belief. I venture that we would apply our brand of modern skepticism to these stories as well. Western Christianity downplays the miraculous, the mysterious, the noumenal. It's difficult for us to believe. Perhaps it's the very act of reading these stories that strengthens our faith. That is, rather than find a rational reason to challenge what is described in these passages, we find solace in the fact that faith plays a role in healing. Healing draws us into a deep, intimate relationship with Christ. We don't need a miracle. We just need to believe that God and healing are there for us. We live in a time when healing of mind, body, and soul is of paramount importance. Why not simply follow the words spoken by Jesus? Don't be afraid. Just believe. This next reading is from Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 12. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he had laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the 12 and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. Good morning, friends. <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit today about Mark chapter 6, devotional that uh, I put together a few weeks ago. It's an interesting chapter that appears in some ways to be a real mishmash of events. As I was reading this, given the miraculousness of Jesus' behavior, I was wondering how many days were actually described in this one chapter. I don't know, but it's safe to say there's a lot going on, and Jesus was a 
very busy man. It's interesting that the response to Jesus in his hometown was astonishment and disbelief. They even go so far as to be somewhat dismissive of him and his family. Isn't he just a carpenter, they ask? And they take shots at the people he hangs out with. You know, Mary, James, Judas, Simon. They take offense at his wisdom, which is pretty odd because we usually respond pretty favorably to people with wisdom. They scoff at him. This sure seems to be a foretelling of what's to come when Jesus is arrested, beaten, doubted, made fun of, ridiculed, and killed like a lowbrow criminal, even in his hometown. I think Jesus recognizes that sometimes our hometowns can be the toughest on us. A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. We still see this today where many leave their hometown to get away from what's holding them back there and to get away from the folks who have crystallized opinions of who they are. Jesus marveled because of their unbelief. Even Jesus was bothered by the treatment from his people, from his hometown. He continued to teach and then called people to be his followers and sent them out two by two. I always found that curious, what's magical about two by two. I'm not sure, but it seems to me that Jesus recognizes that what he's asking them to do is difficult and having a partner is really important. I don't think this is much different than what we recognize and deal with today. We aren't really as effective by ourselves. We need community. We need partners. We need to be out there in two by two, too. I can think of many times in my life where I felt alone only to realize that I wasn't. And whether it's family, my wife, a parent, a sibling, a child, or a friend or coworker, I always found that I was better when I was with others in community. Then there's the story of John the Baptist's head on a platter that sort of comes out of nowhere, and I admit that I have trouble seeing how this story fits into the chapter. The best I can do is that it shows how low people are willing to stoop without much feeling or concern. Herod liked the girl, so he said he'd give her whatever she wanted. Didn't seem to blink an eye when she made her odd ask. It says he was exceedingly sorry, but then he did it immediately without apparently much careful thought. We do this today too, don't we? How many times have we said things or done things that we wish we could take back? You know, the old saying, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. The rest of this chapter describes the miracles. The feeding of the 5,000 is among the most famous of Jesus' miracles. As the ultimate servant leader, he's concerned about feeding the 5,000 plus, And he makes it a priority, even when his di disciples say it can't be done. Then later he walks on water. And this one is interesting because it says that he meant to pass them by. I did a little digging on this as it seemed like an odd phrase to me, and it seems there are two schools of thought. He intended to pass them by to, one, show his divinity, like we see in Exodus 33, with God passing by Moses, or two, make them call out to him for help. To me, it seems these fit nicely together, where he reveals his divinity to them first, and expects them, even teaches them, to reach out to him. He ends the chapter by healing all who come to him, anyone who touches his cloak. He passes by us for a reason. He reminds us who he is and wants us to call out to him. He will heal us and serve us, whether we are strangers or from his hometown. This final reading is from Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 8. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see whether perhaps he would find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again, and his disciples heard it. Then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, It is not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And when the chief priests and the scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him. For they were afraid of him, because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. Hey there, so this is my devotional for the book of Mark, chapter 11. So when Jesus curses the fig tree, 
for not producing any fruit, it's almost like a foreshadowing of what they'll see once they get into Jerusalem. People were using the temple for selling and buying rather than for worship. Jesus becomes very angry and casts everyone out. But there's another meaning behind that fig tree. As it was pointed out in verse 13, there were leaves but no fruit because it wasn't in season. So did we, do we really think that Jesus forgot it wasn't the season for figs? Do we really think that? No. Metaphorically, the tree can represent people today who come off as working for the Lord but not actually producing any fruit. People were welcoming Jesus into Jerusalem like a king. They were putting branches and blankets on the road, lending him a colt to ride on, but then they treated the temple like a, quote, den of robbers, unquote. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in our lives that we do the bare minimum. I'm also very guilty of this. I say I'm a Christian, yet I only go to church sometimes, not every single weekend. I try to help out at church when I can, but there are days when I just don't necessarily give my best effort. So how often is our life really producing the fruit of the Lord? Where can we make the most impact? As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jerusalem, the disciples see a withered fig tree. Another reason he cursed the fig tree was to show his disciples how he trusted in God's power through prayer. There are times when we say we know God's power and we trust in that, but deep down there is a part of us that really isn't truly convinced. That may be another reason we are not producing the fruit of the Lord. We don't have enough faith and cannot, therefore cannot act or do what God wants us to do. Verse 24 says this, Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you, will, that you have received it and it will be yours. If it's as simple as that, why haven't all my prayers come true? It has to do with verse 22, where it says, have faith in God. When something bad happens to us or we hit a roadblock, we ask God, why is this happening to me? It is not for us to question God's authority like the chief priest did. We must trust in him wholeheartedly to do what is best for us. However, that's obviously easier said than done. We are human and therefore not perfect. I recently finished reading The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren which uses 40 days to help us understand God's purpose for us. In it, Warren poses the question, instead of asking God, why is this happening? What if we started asking him, what do you want to teach me? Sometimes faith is as simple as asking the right question. Faith is what gives us, gets us through those difficult times. Faith that God's plan for us is greater than anything we could have ever imagined for ourselves. Faith in his love for us. Thank you. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. When I was 
was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. I felt no worth, you paid it all for me, you have been so, so kind to me, oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, oh, it chases me. Down fights till I'm found Leaves the 99 And I couldn't earn it And I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away and Oh, the overwhelming Never-ending Reckless love of God Dear friends, may God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. May Jesus Christ fill you all with such a spiritual benediction and holiness that we may live together in this world, that in the world to come we may find life everlasting. Go in peace, and may God's richest blessings be with you now and forevermore. Amen.